But as we begin, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God, give us grace. Lord, the constant temptation in ministry is to get out of the chair, to take this into our own hands and do it by our own power. But God, convict our hearts, the truth that you tell us in Scripture, that without you we can do nothing. Without you we can do nothing. So Lord, as, as we move into these practicals, speak to our hearts. Stir. Come, Holy Spirit. Be with us today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So this session, um, in a way, we're, we're giving you the secret sauce or the ingredients for a large group event, a large group event in the new vision of youth formation. Um, and as we do that, there's different components to this sauce. That's the first page of things that you're going to be um, filling in. Um, and some seem very controllable, planable, and doable, and others are not. But we're going to talk about the relationship between the two. Um, but those last four ingredients on the page, um, you can kind of guess what they are already by the, the next page. The G, P, B, and S is where we're going to start. And those stand for gather, proclaim, break, and send. Gather, proclaim, break, and send. And gather, proclaim, break, and send is a structure used um, first kind of put forward by the organization Life Team. In Life Team, they modeled this formula off of the mass. Because if you think of these different movements, not just of a youth night, but also of the mass, you can start to see a natural flow. What happens? First, we gather together. A community comes together. A community comes together. They're united as one, gathering for worship in mass. Next, the word of God is proclaimed, the liturgy of the word. We read the readings of scripture, culminating in the gospel reading. And that word is broken open for us in the homily. The gospel is proclaimed both in the reading of the scripture and also in the teaching of the homily. And then we share in the Eucharist. It's broken open and what is at one time communal also becomes personal. In the Eucharist, something that's communal for all that unites us together is broken and becomes personal. And from there, we're sent out to share Christ with the world. Misa, the Latin name for mass, it means it's the same root word as the word missile. We're shot out from there to go into the world. The church is not meant to exist within these four walls, but to go out into the world and bring the gospel to the nations. But we've got to be prepared for that. So in the Mass, we gather together in worship. The word of God is proclaimed, proclaimed and taught to us in a way in which we can receive it and understand it. Then what is meant for all is broken open and becomes personal. And then we are equipped and sent out to live this. Now, what Life Team did in noticing this movement in the Mass is to take those movements and to use that as a model, knowing that the Eucharist, the liturgy um, that we experience at this table, is a source and summit of our faith. Well, why can't we point that in what we're doing with our youth? So gather, proclaim, break, and send are kind of those four main pieces as we're planning a large group youth event. Now, one of the joys is we have pilot parishes doing this, incredibly blessed by Rebecca's witness, um, and particularly so too by those videos that are being put together, sharing some of the experience from the young people at Christ the Redeemer, one of those pilot parishes. Now, a joy for y'all is you don't have to come up with this stuff from scratch. One of the reasons those pilot parishes have been going is to work out some of the kinks so y'all don't have to, so we can learn from some of the mistakes that are made so y'all don't have to encounter those same mistakes or the ones that are inevitable, how to push through them. But also, they're writing some of these materials in a structure of gather, proclaim, break, and send that's in unity with the overall vision that focuses on formation of the whole human person, not just of this, 
not just of this, but the whole human person. Not just a spiritual formation, but an integrated formation in which the gospel is integrated into their day-to-day -day lives. Um, one where the focus is on a relationship with Jesus, leading teens to an intimate relationship with Jesus, and accompaniment being a key piece of that, where you're able to walk alongside. So one of the joys from those pilot parishes is this format. The key pieces here of gather, proclaim, break, and send for this first year are going to be handed on to you. Now, there's going to be a temptation there. Whenever we have a manual, whenever we have pieces that we can sit and plan and piece together, there's a temptation to go back to the I rather than focus on the him for us to take it into control. So I just want to frame this so that way we're mindful in all of this. Get excited, because this stuff is exciting. At the same time, stay in the chair. So breaking these open a little bit deeper, what does gather, proclaim, break, and send look like in a large group night? Well, the, the secret of this week, pulling back the curtain a little bit, is we've been modeling this for you. Maybe you haven't noticed this, but each of the sessions that we've been doing this weekend have been gather, proclaim, break, and send. So think of yesterday morning. What did we do in here yesterday morning? After morning prayer, we started with a gathering activity. We played Bear, Hunter, Ninja. The gather is a fun time for people to come together as one community and get, kind of get the nerves out. We call this an icebreaker for a reason. Kind of those tough spots can be chipped away. The point of a gathering activity to start off a large group night is that it creates a joyful environment. The teens, when they walk in, as I said yesterday, and they see adults, when they walk into a room and they know the adults are there and they've prepared it, usually what that means is the adults are up here and we're down here. And we have to submit to whatever they're saying. And they automatically take a position of those people are in authority and I'm below them. What does a gather do? It levels the playing field. It takes the pressure off. And it says, hey, we're here to enjoy one another's company. Can let our hair down a little bit. I don't have much hair to let down, but if I did, I'd let it down right now. <laughs> One of the key pieces with the gathering activity is for us to participate. Some of you are all like, but my knees, my knees. <laughs> They'll definitely beat me in quick math. That'll be embarrassing. <laughs> when we participate in the gathering activities, what it shows is we haven't just prepared something for you, but we're walking this journey with you. We're in here with you. And the amount of joy and enthusiasm which your team sets in models with the gathering activity will be a model for them of what their joy and enthusiasm can be. If we lead a game and we are so, we just think this is the cheesiest thing in the world, and I'm not excited, that's going to show on our faces, and they're going to feel exactly the same way. So enter in with joy and build a joyful community. Now, I want to be clear. As we're breaking down the gather, proclaim, break, and send, we don't have time to go super in-depth in each of them. So I'm just going to give you a little taste, and there's going to be follow-up trainings taking them a little bit deeper there. So it's not just necessarily a game that can start off um, a youth night. It can also be a funny video. Sometimes I've found uh, like YouTube clips that are, that are even popular that we can maybe even tie in a little bit, um, or a skit. Oftentimes, if you have teens who are really involved, um, this might be something that you can hand to them to do a funny skit to kind of get people laughing. It could be a, a game. And with games, there's different kinds of games. There's large group mixing games, like what we just did with Quick Math or Bear um, Hunter Ninja. Um, or there's upfront games. If you all were with us at the Junior High Faith Experience, we did a game where Father JD got pied in the face. It was fantastic. <laughs> That's right. Um, but there were only four participants. There were only four participants from the audience of the teens. But it was a game where by doing that up front and it having an effect of comedy and joy and them being in on the secret, um, it still created that joyful environment for them. So there's mixer games, there's up front games, there's small group challenges that you could do with your small groups, competing small group against small group. That's a great way to build unity within your small group. So those are just some different um, pieces of the gather. The next thing we move into is proclaim. Now, what happens at Mass? At Mass, we read the scripture readings, we sing the psalm, but what happens next? A priest or a deacon comes up, and they take that word of God, and they, they share it 
in a way where hopefully, God willing, it can pierce here and enter into our lives. The proclaim is not called a teaching. Notice that. It's not called a teaching. It's called a proclaim. What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? Well, what is the gospel? The gospel is good news. But maybe you all have experienced this yourselves. If you go into, or maybe you know young people who have experienced this, going into that one girl who was talking about the book yesterday in the video. The book. The book. Yeah, she was not happy with the book. <laughs> Why? Why might that be? She didn't experience, for whatever reason, she didn't experience what was trying to be communicated as good news. But everything within our Catholic faith is good news. Everything is good news. How can we help them see that? Teens come in assuming that what we have to say has no relevance to their life. How can we change that? How can we bridge these two places? Yes, we must catechize. We must give them solid, clear truth. As we'll talk about in the next session about Gen Z, they're not receiving clear teachings about what's true and what's not. They're receiving sound bites. We must give them clear, solid truth and answer real questions. But if we stay up here, there's no difference between science class and math class, history and religion. It's just more facts to learn. <laughs> How is this good news that changes my heart and changes the way I live my life? So just as, as an example, I was, I was trying to think of an example I could give um, from my previous experience. Um, we did a series, uh, kind of four life nights, um, four large group gatherings in a row on sin. We called it Sin or Nah, um, just as like a fun, catchy title. Um, and in this we catechized, we formed the mind, and we talked about the difference between venial sin and mortal sin. We talked about what makes a mortal sin. We, we talked about some of the things that um, uh, affect our culpability, our kind of uh, responsibility in a sin. We talked about act, intention, and circumstance. We, they got real formation in the moral teaching of the church and the teaching about sin. But in the course of that, why we called it sin or nah, is... At the end of the teaching, I threw up some slides and explained some situations, describing situations that teens might find themselves into, in and potential sins that they would commit. And I read out these scenarios that I knew would be relevant to their lives. And I asked them, in your small group, I want you to debate, was this a sin or not? Nah? And they got to debate amongst themselves. And then we took a poll of the audience. And then I asked them to explain their positions. We brought out things like um, with uh, act, intention, circumstance. You can have good intentions to do something good, but if you do it for the wrong reason, man, well, then it becomes a sin. Or I'm sorry, you could have good intentions, but you do a bad thing for the right reasons. That's a sin. So anyways, we tried to connect what was going on with the formation here with their heart and helping them understand what their own actions um, and their own sin or potential sin. So some examples of what's going on are some practicals here. A teaching really shouldn't be longer than 15 minutes. A teaching should not be longer than 15 minutes. If you go longer than that, they're going to zone out. I've heard somebody say a, a good measure um, for the length of a teaching, how old are they? In that, many minutes. So if you have 13-year-olds in the crowd, 13. If you have 13 and 18-year-olds in the crowd, 13. So keep it short. And for me, I have to plan on going shorter because I know I'm going to be tempted to go longer. In the moment, just more things are going to come up. So plan that out. Um, how long are you going to go knowing your crowd and never go over 15 minutes? This doesn't have to be just one person. This could be a tag team talk. Um, this could include some uh, kind of participatory stuff. Like uh, uh, in the middle of a talk, I could ask a question and kind of pull the audience, that sort of a thing. Um, this could be a video base. This could be a debate. Um, this could be a witness or testimony. I would say, generally speaking, you should generally, 90% of the time, have a component, 90 to 100% of the time, have a component of witness or testimony. Somebody sharing their own experience, how this connected to their own heart and their own life. That could be one of you. That could be a teen. 
it doesn't just have to fall on you for these proclaims. Some of y'all are thinking like, man, you, you just talked about some of those components of your like sin or nah session. I have no idea what the heck you were talking about, Nick. That's okay. You don't have to be an expert in everything. Who is? Bring in a pastor. Bring in a deacon. Bring in, if you're having a night about marriage, bring in another couple. If you're having an issue night where you're diving into um, maybe Catholic dating, well, bring in a young couple who's dating or who's walked that experience and have them share their story. You don't have to do it all. Find people. Prayerfully find people and bring them in. So again, the proclaim shares the gospel message, the good news, in a way that connects not just here, but to their heart, to their lives as well. So gather, proclaim, break. So after each of our sessions, we had a break for y'all, where y'all either ended up in small groups and discussed um, personally how what you're hearing affects you, your thoughts, feelings on it, um, or we sent you into a time of prayer for you and him to break that open. But in whatever way, what that break does is, again, just like the Mass, it takes something communal, that communal teaching, or the body of Christ that unites us together, the teaching of truth, and then it is broken open to become personal to me. The body of Christ meant for all, I receive. And in that relationship with him, he speaks to my heart, my issues, so small groups are going to be the primary way that y'all do this. Um, and we're going to have some deeper formation on leading small groups. Um, we're going to uh, be filming a session in the next couple of weeks that's going to be available online to start to help y'all wrap your mind around leading small groups. But we're also going to have some in-person training um, for y'all in the fall on leading small groups. Um, but small groups, the purpose of small groups, you could say simply, the proclaim is where we say what we think, and the small group is where they say what they think. The point of your small group is not to convince them to think like you. The goal of your small group is to create a safe environment in which they can share themselves, and through that process, creating a safe environment, be open to receiving truth. Again, the goal of your small group is not to have them leave convinced of what you're trying to say. It's for them to feel safe and seen, known, and loved. But it might not always be a small group. It might be a partner. Turn to a neighbor. We're going to throw some questions up on the screen. We want you to, to talk about those questions with your neighbor. Um, or take a walk with your neighbor and, and talk about this. It might be silence. A time of silence, maybe there's journaling. This is one of my favorite um, to sprinkle in every now and then. To have them sit in silence, put some background music on, and give them a couple of personal reflection questions to journal on. A space for them to pray. They don't, they don't get that. They don't get quiet moments to reflect. And then one of my favorite things to do after that is to invite, if the environment's right, if anybody would like to share kind of what they're processing through. That's a great break. Could be a little questionnaire. But the beauty of small groups, why that's a key focus, is it's creating community, true, authentic community where they learn how to have real conversations and start to process the gospel together and then walk together towards Christ. So we're going to talk about in the next session, true community, real conversation, an environment in which they're seen and known and loved as they are, it's rare. It's rare. So we want to create that for them. So gather, proclaim, break, and send. So send takes the gather, proclaim, and break and equips them for living that out going forward. So some examples of sends might be accountability. Maybe that's in our small group. Why don't we get back together with our small groups and talk about how we can keep each other accountable. We had a night on prayer, say. How can we keep each other accountable to each make sure we get five to ten minutes of prayer every day? Well, let's make a group text. And let's send that out um, each day, a reminder, and I'll check in with one another. It could be a challenge for the week. It could be a time of intercessory prayer as a group where we lift up intentions. It could be adoration. You know, that was a send for us, kind of wrapping everything together and letting the Lord speak into our own hearts. It could be a rosary liturgy of the hours, guided Lexio Divina or personal. 
could be prayer partners or small group prayer. One, um, in my uh, experiences with youth ministry, uh, small groups were so effective in having consistent small groups, a consistent group of teens and mentors, of volunteers who were um, journeying together through the course of a year, that oftentimes we would end our nights, our send would be um, what we call just small group prayer. In that, they'd go around the circle, and the first time it got to them, they would say, thank you, Lord, for, and they'd name at least one thing or more that they were thankful for. And they'd go around the circle, everybody would say, thank you, Lord, for, thank you, God, for, blah, 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 blah. The second time it got to them, it was in intentions. Lord, I want to pray for X, Y, and Z. What does that do? It, another place to open up in vulnerability, and it also gives you a sneak peek into their lives. What are they concerned about? What are they worried about? And then next week, you can come back and ask, hey, you prayed last week about your bio test, or hey, you said your mom was feeling really sick. How's she doing? How's she doing? You know what that means to a young person that you remember that? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Gather, proclaim, break, and send. So those um, four pieces, you can sit down and plan out what's our game, who's leading it? What's the talk? Who's given it? What's our break? Small groups, let's write the questions. What's our send? What are the things that we need for adoration? Who's going to set it up? And if you have those four things alone, it's going to flop. It's going to flop. And this is the secret sauce. So these are the first four pieces there. Those, the latter half, what I just walked through, gather, proclaim, break, and send, you can control easily without the Lord. And it will flop. These first four take something much deeper. So the first one is listening prayer. Listening prayer. This weekend, our content, uh, as somebody coming in, I, I feel from the conversations I've had and just get, getting able, being able to see y'all from this point of view, I see freedom and joy, excitement, and even for some people who walked in thinking, man, I don't know about this whole thing. I'm scared, I'm the wrong person, I don't think this is gonna work. I see a renewed sense of hope and joy and belief. That was God. You know how we planned this thing? We got together and we prayed. We asked God, you know these people. You know who's gonna be there and what they need. God, what do you desire for them? You might have seen the team gathering together two or three times a day during this weekend. What we are doing there is we are regrouping and we are saying, God, where are they at? What's going on in their hearts? And what do they need? God, you tell us. And stuff has changed. Stuff has changed this weekend in process because God has spoken something new. And y'all's experience we could have had a cookie cutter thing that we had the schedule, we had the gather, proclaim, breaks, and sends, and we just did it. But without that listening prayer, that's where God comes in and he brings freedom because God knows. God has a plan. God knows your heart. He knows what you needed. So listening prayer in our planning process, in our debriefs after our night, to come to the Lord and say, Lord, what are you saying? Lord, where are you moving? Lord, what do you desire for them? One of the places that our schedule is changing today is we're going to equip y'all for listening prayer. We're going to equip y'all. Um, we had planned during the breakout session to have a session on relational ministry and small group ministry um, uh, two, offered two times. Um, but as we prayed, we felt like God stirring so much for y'all connecting here that if we left here without equipping y'all to listen to him um, and let him speak into your ministry, that, that, that's a big deal that God really wanted to speak that. So we've changed this afternoon. We're still gonna have a session on relational ministry, um, but we're gonna do that all together instead of a breakout. And then afterwards, we're gonna do listening prayer, formation, how y'all as a team and individually can do that um, going forward from here. Yesterday, how many of y'all were blessed by Father Mark's teaching about St. Ignatius's rules of discernment? Like kind of recognizing those obstacles, the false reasons. Yeah, I see a lot of nodding heads here, hands going up, yeah. How we did that, Father Mark was in the back praying during that session, and that wasn't planned. That wasn't in the original schedule. But as it was happening, I was like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> but at the same time, as I was listening, I was like, oh, this is exactly what needed to happen. We've got to let the Lord guide and not grasp. 
Because when I grasp, you get Nick. When I let go, you get the Lord. Y'all need the Lord, not Nick. Y'all know that. <laughs> Listening prayer. The second piece there is environment. The environment, the physical space that you walk into communicates something about what you can expect. For many of us, y'all know your parishes so well that you've just become so familiarized with the environment as it is that you won't see it as a T and see it. We need to ask the Lord to give us new eyes to see this space. This is beautiful, y'all, right? Y'all have seen this room without this? What do you like better, this or the old way? This, this is nice, right? Like, it's a little homey. It's beautiful. It draws us into prayer. I love the little things, these lamps around the corner. Where do y'all have lamps? Do you have them in conference centers? No. You have lamps in your living room, a place that you sit down and have deep conversations. The environment matters. The environment matters. So to give y'all some practical um, thoughts on this, I think we've got a couple of photos from Christ the Redeemer of some environments that they set up, one from their large group, um, environment and one from some liturgies. Could we get the lights down, Joe? Thanks, dude. So this is from their life night. You're probably looking at this and you're like, what the heck did they build? How much did that cost? Oh my gosh, what would the setup time be for this? Um, when they brought it in today, it's set up across the hall in the atrium for y'all to get an idea and to look at how they put this th together. Um, they said, all right, it's gonna take us about five minutes to move it over there and set it up. You can do this stuff simply, but this environment, does that look like they're in a church conference room right now? That looks like they're in a coffee shop. And it's simple, and it's effective. We, again, we have this set up in the atrium across the hall during lunch or free time. Um, go ahead and pop over there so y'all can see it and take a, a closer look. Them sitting, um, not in cold, sterile chairs and at tables. Um, they're on comfortable chairs, bean bags, or on cushions on the floor. It creates a more homey, inviting atmosphere. It doesn't feel like school. It doesn't feel like school. Um, the next one, this is from one of their um, sends that they did, a prayer, prayerful liturgy. How many of y'all have been to Christ the Redeemer? You all know what it looks like generally? Yeah, so this environment that they set up is very simple. It's very simple. So for adoration, they lit some candelabras. Those are the fancy candle things on the altar beautiful in itself. They used a sacred image, and on the steps that they already had, using some boxes, they put up some linens with some candles, dimmed the lights, and it created a new environment. I noticed last night during adoration, we started with all the lights off except for this row, and then they turned it off. It made a difference when they turned this off, right? Because the focus was there. Is an ambiance. We've got a video, um, a short video of some of the teens from Christ Redeemer talking about the effect the environment had on their experience. We're going to throw that up for you. So the environment really changed from last year to this year. It was, I don't know, the fairy lights just made it more homey and like made it more comfortable to talk and like share everything with each other. As if last year it was just like plain pencil and book, dull, like, you know, it's just like going to school for another like nobody likes school, so. But this year it was a place to like escape and like just at your home with your friends, which made it like 10 times better. So that was great. Yeah, um, it, was, it was more set up as like a, rather than a classroom, more of like an open conversation. You'd have like a, a setup where people were talking at, but you'd also have people more relaxed rather than like made to focus. And it's not that you can't focus with that. It's more that you're, you, you feel like you're able to listen rather than forced to listen. What he communicated there was he felt invited welcomed. Most of our church buildings are built to be functional, not warm and welcoming. We put up fluorescent lighting. Um, it's like, uh, like, at least for my home parish, I felt like maybe the parish council had an argument about what would be the ugliest carpet for them to put in. <laughs> like, no, this one's way uglier. Let's go that route. 
I invite you as a team, I invite you to, as a team to walk through your spaces and to ask and to discuss how would a teen feel about this space? And how can we make it more warm and welcoming and inviting? It matters. These little things matter. Y'all are probably thinking about that and asking, all right, where are we going to store the stuff? Where's the money coming from for this stuff? How long is it going to take to set this up for an hour and a half event and then take it down afterwards each week? This is much more than what they did at Christ the Redeemer. This is a lot of work. This took a while, longer than it would take for y'all to set up what Christ the Redeemer did. But this helped y'all experience welcome and the Lord. You are worth it. You are worth the time it took for our team to set this up. You are worth the time it took for our team to find lamps and bring them into this room. You're worth the time for us to think about when should we dim the lights. You are worth that. Your teams are worth that. They are worth the time, the energy, the thoughts. And they notice. They notice when you make the effort. The environment matters. The next piece there, the H, is hospitality. And before that H, I want you to write another word. I want you to write the word radical. Because what we desire is radical hospitality. Hospitality is to make somebody who's an outsider or a stranger feel welcomed. And radical means far-reaching, thorough. We want you to thoroughly welcome people into this environment. Now, as y'all were coming in to check in on Friday evening, um, there's a line forming. Um, and when you got to that table, um, hopefully there were three people. That's four. I'd be really bad at quick math. There were three people there checking y'all in. We could have probably done that process with one person. But one person, that line would have moved a lot slower. And with three people, there were three points as you walked in where somebody said, hi, what's your name? Where are you coming from? It's really good that you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here, for taking the time this weekend. That makes a difference. Hospitality is, is Mama Cat in the back? Mama Cat, could you come up here for a second? Has anybody seen this woman running around this weekend? Hospitality is being up early to make sure the coffee is ready. Hospitality is sorting out all the meals, sorting out all the utensils, the plates, making sure it's ready, and when things run out, replenishing it. Hospitality is the little things that often go unnoticed, but when it happens, it just happens easy. It, does it actually happen easy? No. <laughs> no, but let me tell you something. It happens easy for me this particular weekend because I spent 10 years in the trenches that you guys are about to enter into. And it's well worth every minute I spend here. Mm. You will be rewarded <laughs> abundantly by your efforts. Amen. You do hospitality when you love people. Mama Cat's hospitality, thank you, Mama Cat. <laughs> Mama Kat's hospitality this weekend comes because she was preparing a place out of love for you. Does she know each of you personally? Probably a lot of y'all because it's Mama Kat, but not all of y'all, but she loves you. She loves you. Hospitality, those little things show and communicate love. And when we are intentionally thinking about how can we show that hospitality and love to our teens, they feel it. They feel it. The last piece there is relational ministry. Relational ministry is the next step from hospitality. Hospitality is creating and sustaining an environment in which they feel welcomed, where things are running smoothly, that's warm and inviting. We can plan an environment 
prepare it ahead of time, assign people to move it in, set it up, and tear it down. And give good thought to it. And that's good, and it goes a long way. We can plan to make sure we have all that we need for each of the different pieces of our nights and have somebody making sure that things get restocked, that the little details don't go unnoticed, and that's a really good thing, hospitality. But the next step from there is relationship. And relationship cannot be planned and controlled. Relationship is not simply a team effort every single one of us entering into intentional relationship with these young people. How many of y'all, show of hands, were greeted as you came in to check in for the retreat on Friday? Yeah, okay, awesome. How many of y'all at some point this weekend um, had a conversation, whether deep or surface level, um, but a conversation with a team member, somebody on our team wearing a yellow badge, somebody on the youth support team? Yeah, a lot of y'all. How many of y'all had a deeper conversation with somebody on our team this weekend, whether about your own life, what's going on in your heart, your ministry? Yeah, yeah. How many of y'all have the presence of our team and their willingness to engage with you? Has that increased or bettered your experience of this weekend? Now, we could have planned all of this, planned our talks, given you the same exact content and not been present to you, not sat down with you at lunches, gone back to our rooms quickly at night. But what would that communicate? Communicate, we're just here to teach y'all something. We don't really care about you. It takes a vulnerability to enter into relational ministry. We're going to dive deeper into that um, this afternoon about the practicals of relational ministry. Now, as I mentioned, coming into this weekend, I am not a Louisiana native, um, and I had to recruit some help from Nan in the back here um, to help me come up with this image. Um, I wanted to give a Cajun-appropriate image for um, this secret sauce, the ingredients here. Um, because as I said in the beginning, with the gather, proclaim, break, and send, and even with some of those other components, You can plan those and control those and hold on to them and execute them. But without the heart of love, a love for the Lord first and a love for his young people, the thing falls apart. So forgive me because I'll probably butcher this, but I'm going to talk about gumbo a little bit. So I had Nan sit me down and tell me about making gumbo. Um, And she said, in a good gumbo, there's a couple of things you need. She said, one, the whole process, every single piece of the process, you need love. Love for what you're doing and love for the people who are going to be eating it. I've heard uh, creating that roux, you got to sit for about 20 minutes going like that, something like that, nonstop. Yeah, that's time consuming. Now, is that just a chore so that way you can get to the other parts? Or is that necessary? It's necessary, and when you do it with love, you're paying attention, you're feeling your way through it. You're feeling your way through it, not just going by, all right, I do this for 20 minutes, I stir about this many times. It's different reading it off a page versus doing it with love. The Trinity, I've learned recently about the Trinity. It says, forgive me if I mess this up, celery, yeah? Onions and green peppers? Yeah, all right, all right, so the Trinity. I've heard if I get a Cajun meal, a Louisiana meal, and it doesn't have the Trinity in it, it's probably fake. (laughs) It's in everything. It's in everything. There's big pieces that people notice when a foreigner like me comes in and eats jambalaya. They notice a sausage. They notice the rice. There's some sort of spices in here. Y'all know there's much more that goes into that. And what makes Louisiana food, cuisine, distinct in this whole country It's the fact that it's prepared with love and intentionality. It's the unseen things that go in because of love for the art and love for the recipient that make it what it is. You listening to the Lord and letting him guide your planning, coming back to him constantly, Lord, where are they at? Where do you desire to take them? That's love every step of the way. 
the time and energy and commitment that you take to look at your environment and to create something out of what might be the ugliest room you have ever stepped foot in, where a teen will walk in there and say, wow, is this the same place? That's love and intentionality. Your radical hospitality to make sure every teen that walks through those doors is greeted. Hey, what's your name? Thanks for being here. It's so good that you're here. We're really excited about this. What school do you go to? That's love. Entering into relationship with the young people. I'm going to make a little confession here. I'm an introvert. Any other introverts in the room? Introverts in the room? Yeah. I, I re-energize going to my room and reading a book, listening to a good record. Quiet. Relational ministry is hard for me. Um, we wanted to model this week, this weekend, what a good youth formation event might look like. And at the beginning of it, I was like getting all my notes together, making sure I knew where everything was, talking to these guys about um, what I needed to know um, for the practicals. And I saw that line forming to check in. And I knew, all right, Nick, this is it. <laughs> this is that moment where you go in and you actually make contact. I don't like doing that. It's awkward for me. It's awkward for me. I, uh, sitting down with a group of strangers at lunch, it, I feel awkward about it. Hopefully, y'all didn't notice too much as I talked to y'all. Um, but I knew it would change your experience of this weekend. And I knew I wanted to know you. I didn't just want you to know what I know. I wanted to know you and walk with you. So with all of that... Um, there's a constant temptation, as we've been saying, to get out of the chair. Um, and this morning, as, I was, uh, as our team was gathered and pray, praying about this day, um, Rock shared a story with me that I thought was really poignant. Um, as y'all are starting to get these pieces, the ingredients for the secret sauce, and starting to plan, and you're like, all right, we can put together the manual now. <laughs> a story that was really poignant um, for us in our understanding of what the temptation looks like in reality and how we can respond with grace and help each other. So Rock, I'd, I'd like to invite Rock up here um, to share with us. And before Rock does, I would like to point out um, Rock and Tyler behind the camera over here. So much of what you see here, what you've seen there, the videos that you've been um, receiving and blessed by, those have been edited by Tyler in real time this weekend as this conference has been going on, knowing it would be a blessing for us. And they have taken a lot of time to prepare this welcoming environment and to get it all set up so that way this thing runs seamlessly. That's love and intentionality. So thank you, Rock. Thank you, Tyler, for what y'all have done. And as we close, uh, yeah, Rock, I'd, I'd love for y'all you to share um, with the audience this, this story that you shared with me. Sure, well. sure. I love environment. I just, I love trying to make a space for people to feel more human and more real. Um, throughout the weekend, we've been hearing about staying in the chair and whenever that we're not just in chair mode and mission mode, that we're not just trying to just get filled up and then close my heart and then go give, give, give. Um, that's not an easy journey. Uh, you know, we learn that, learning to stay in the chair, even when we're doing ministry, uh, even when we're loving other people. So I wanted to share a quick story about, I'll never forget the day that I learned and that the Lord showed me that I was getting up out the chair. Um, many years ago, when I was starting to do a lot of ministry with youth, I was teaching at a high school, um, uh, 17, 18 year old boys. I was doing campus ministry. I was working for another nonprofit, teaching and mentoring. And I was just go, 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 do, do, do. And I loved what I was doing. Um, and then I got tired pretty quickly because I wasn't really praying. Then I met a great priest who taught me how to pray and taught me how to stay in the chair. Um, so I was staying in the chair. And then I went up, I got up out the chair and went and loved my kids. So I kept doing that for a while. And I'll never forget the day. Um, I was actually doing a series of talks in Abbeville uh, one Saturday, and I had this helper. Her name was Brooke. She was a sweetheart, 
beautiful, beautiful woman who I respected deeply. And she would help me with all the details, getting all the papers together for the room and helping me set up the room. We would go to 6 a.m. mass first, um, so I can get filled up, right? And then we would leave from there, go to the church parish. Uh, it was another church parish, and we'd set up. And then I'd, I'd do the talks, right? And do the talks. And uh, so we were at mass, and my heart was open, and I'm receiving from the Lord, and I, I feel very close to him, and I'm in communion with him. And after Mass, we both kneel down to pray for a minute. And then I'm like, all right, all right, all right. I'm getting excited because I get to do all this stuff today, and uh, I can't wait to see the teens. And uh, right, and I was looking at my watch, and I'm like, all right, all right, time to go, time to go. I got I to gotta go look at my notes. I got to set up the classroom. I, I got I to gotta get my talk together, all right? I, 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 my, 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 right? <laughs> And so as soon as I look at my watch and I get up, I see Brooke walking to the front of the church and going to kneel down by Mary, the statue of Mary, to pray uh, and just ask Mary's intercession for the day. And when I saw that, all this resentment came up in my heart. What are you doing? We have to go. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, why am I resenting this woman who I respect so much, you know? And the Lord just called me out very lovingly, like, dude, you just shut your heart down. You were with me throughout the Mass, and then you closed. You, know, you looked at your watch, you closed and got in this mission mode, and you're leaving me behind. Like, what are you doing? And she taught me that to keep my heart open. Um, now, again, it would take a, a little bit longer in my life to learn how to do that better and better. Um, As that same priest taught me how to pray, he taught me, and other wonderful people like Nick taught me how to stay in the chair while I'm loving the people in front of me. Um, And that takes time, and to not, you know, judge yourself, like, I got to be there now, I got to be able to do this perfectly. But I, I, I can just tell you, lastly, that the more I prayed regularly every day, and the more the Lord gave me the gift of prayer and taught me how to relate to Him and how to listen to Him... The more I did that every day, then the more it wasn't like I was going to pray, and then I got up for my prayer. But those specific times of prayer every day helped me to think about him and talk to him throughout every day. And then whatever I was doing, um, and in particular when I was uh, loving those teens, um, I, I felt I was more with the Lord. If you married couples out there, I'm sure that maybe when you first started dating or you were engaged or when you first got married, for those of you that were doing some other function when you were away from your spouse, whether you're at work or doing a household chore, maybe you weren't thinking about that spouse all the time. Or, but as that marriage went on, and the more you got to know them, and the more time you spent with them, you started thinking about them all the time. They became a part of your entire life. And maybe when you're at work or when you're doing other chores, you're thinking about that spouse with you, especially if you're doing something really difficult and that they're, they're with you and that, yeah, I know she's praying for me and I, I know she's with me. And same, same with God. The more time we spend with him and the more regular time we have with him, then when we do whatever we do, he, he's with us all the time. Does that make sense? So I just want to share that with you all. Thanks so much.